Hello, good evening, guys. Okay, so guys, today we are going to start a new chapter, and that is atomic structure. Last class we have finished a uh, general organic chemistry. Okay, this is the second chapter of physical chemistry. Okay, first chapter some basic concepts we have discussed. That is the second part of that. That is more concept two. We'll discuss after. Periodic properties. Okay, so atomic structure. In this chapter, we are going to study about atoms. Okay, we know already the definition of atoms. Okay, what are the various subatomic particles we have? Their discovery. all these things we are going to understand in this chapter okay like we all know atom is given by a greek word that word atom is given by a greek word that is atomios okay atomios it is a greek word and this means this means indivisible this means indivisible me, me, means what which we cannot divide because earlier the understanding was didn't get your stuti what book you are talking about oh notebook you are talking about right okay uh the general organic chemistry it is a part of organic chemistry so it would be better if you use a different notebook for this okay you should have one notebook for physical one for organic another one for inorganic okay so this is better if you write in a different notebook okay so atomios means indivisible right which cannot be divided further because earlier the understanding was what that atoms are the smallest particle which we cannot divide further okay that is what the understanding regarding the atom we had okay the theory of atom is given by a scientist called john dalton theory of atom is given by a scientist called john dalton in between 1803 by john dalton and this theory was given during this time 1803 to 1808 these things you don't have to memorize okay so this theory we call it as dalton's atomic theory
Dalton Atomic Theory. Okay. So today this chapter is mainly about the theory. Okay, because there are so many theoretical things that we need to understand before going into the numerical part. Okay. So we'll take the reference of uh, classical physics also here, right? So this today's session mostly it is all about the theoretical aspect of all these things that we have. Okay. So this theory we call it as Dalton's atomic theory. What is Dalton's atomic theory? There are a few postulates of this. Write it down, all of you. That all particles in this world. All particles in this world are made up of. In this world are. Are made up of. made up of very small elements called particles elements called atoms means everything is made up of atoms okay there are so many atoms present in any one in any compound right so there are like you know the basic unit for any matter is atom that is what john dalton said second point atoms of different element has different properties atoms of different element has different different element has different properties okay like the atoms of carbon has its own property atoms of nitrogen oxygen has its own property different okay atoms cannot be created or destroyed cannot be created or destroyed which was obviously wrong this postulate this theory of atom was wrong when various subatomic particles like electron proton neutron discovered right so john dalton said that atoms cannot be created or destroyed but this theory this theory was proved to be wrong when various subatomic particles particles like electron proton neutron etc discovered okay copy down these points atoms cannot be created or destroyed but this theory was proved to be wrong when various subatomic particles like electron proton neutron other particles are meson positron discovered okay done okay now you write down discovery of subatomic particles
discovery of sub atomic particles okay the first one we have the first one is electron right the discovery of electron there is an experiment and this experiment we call it as cathode ray cathode ray experiment okay the experiment related questions they won't ask much but i'll just discuss the the experimental setup and other things over here okay so this is the experimental setup we have okay experimental setup is this this one you see here this is a discharge tube the cylindrical glass tube it is a discharge tube okay you don't have to draw this it is not that important okay and uh, i would suggest that if you want to draw you can draw it later okay because we are already you know um, our syllabus is already lagging behind from the other batches that's why i am taking this reference so that i can save time in drawing this so what i am suggesting you try to understand this now okay it is given in your book ncert you can draw it from there also later on if you want but you, did, you don't need the diagram here they won't you know ask you to draw the diagram okay it is not that tough you can understand it easily right so what happens here we take a cylindrical glass tube this is a discharge tube the cylindrical glass tube that you have it is the discharge tube okay so what happens in discharge tube it contains two electrode on it these are the electrodes okay this one and this one okay this is electrode that is cathode and this one is anode cathode this one is anode this electrode connected to one high voltage source from this we use a vacuum pump to maintain low pressure in the tube low pressure in the tube approximately 10 to the power minus 4 atmospheric we use here in this uh, tube right and this discharge tube is filled at with an any gas over here we remove all the air and we fill any gas into this discharge tube when you allow when you connect this with a very high voltage source we see an invisible ray right an invisible ray coming from the cathode electrode towards the anode electrode this is invisible ray and since it is coming out of cathode we call it as cathode ray right this side it is zns fluorescent screen we have here it is coated with the zns screen okay so this is starts glowing actually when you connect this an external source this part starts glowing which confirms that that something some invisible ray is moving from cathode to anode side and when it strikes on this side it starts glowing right so this invisible ray we call it as cathode ray called cathode ray so this entire experiment i am not dictating you i would suggest you request you to after the class you just read out these things in the book ncert okay you will understand it okay not much important but yes go through once okay this is called cathode ray now this cathode ray has some properties okay we'll discuss those properties right write down the properties of it properties you write down on the experiment i have told you 
that there is a discharge tube connected with a two end with an electrode electrode is connected with an external source of battery when we connect this with a battery a very uh, an invisible ray comes from cathode plate hence we call it as cathode ray travels towards anode in a straight line okay so write down the property first one cathode rays cathode rays travels travels along a straight line travels along a straight line and forms shadow of any obstacle obstacle or object anything you can write cathode ray travels along a straight line and forms shadow of any obstacle okay now what we do if you place here a positive plate this side and this side this side if you place a positive plate we observe that this ray bend towards this positive plate if you plate this this side okay it moves like this so it means it is attracted towards the positive plate it means this is negatively charged okay so write down the second point this this ray or cathode ray write down cathode ray is a stream of negative charged particles called electrons cathode ray is a stream of negative charged particles called electrons okay next point write down consist of negative charged particle called electron next point it produces it produces mechanical effect it produces mechanical effect this means what suppose a cathode ray we have a fan blade suppose here we have a fan blade which is this one right and suppose the cathode ray if you strikes on this fan blade in this direction these are the cathode ray we have suppose so when you strikes this fan blade with this cathode ray so what we observe all these are experimental facts we have actually okay so this is cathode ray so when it strikes to this fan blade we observe that this fan blade starts rotating in this sense okay means what this provide provides some energy to this fan blade and hence it starts rotating in this direction like this okay this is mechanical effect okay it produces or it, it it imparts energy to any object this is mechanical effect okay fourth point you write down the last point the behavior of cathode ray is same for all gases 
the behavior of cathode ray is same for all gases why it is same for all gases means what whatever gas we use in this discharge tube here we have gas present whatever gas you use here the property of cathode ray is same it won't change why because electrons are electrons only whether it is present in hydrogen carbon dioxide oxygen nitrogen right the property of electron won't change with different different gases correct so hence since it is the stream of negative charged particle called electron hence with the change in gas the property won't change for cathode ray okay so these are the uh, you know properties of cathode cathode ray property is important okay you must keep that in now after this experiment what happens this this we call it as cathode ray experiment and the ray here comes out from cathode we call it as cathode okay after this experiment after this experiment we came to this conclusion that within an atom there is a negative charged particle present okay so since we know that the atom is electrically neutral and if there is any negative charged particle it means there must be some positive charged particle which neutralizes the negative charged particle and makes the atom overall what neutral because we know atom overall is neutral so if negative charged particle is present this means we must have some positive charged particle present which makes the atom neutral over correct right? so this gives us an idea that within an atom there must be some negative positive charged particles present and hence the scientists that that point of time they started looking for the another subatomic particles which must be positively charged and in this way only they have you know come to this conclusion that a positive charged particles called proton exist within an atom also okay so for that also we have the similar kind of experiment okay the so second point you write down the discovery of proton so you look at this diagram here exactly same the only difference here that we take a perforated cathode plate here it is exactly same just one change we have here and the change is this that the cathode ray we have we take it as perforated cathode ray like this the holes what there so what they observe the moment where the anode sorry the cathode ray comes out from this uh, you know cathode plate so first of all you see this this particular plate is cathode this the perforated one is cathode it is written over here and it is connected to the battery this side so well, it is the cathode this is cathode written over here so here we have perforated cathode plate that is the only difference we have in the two experiments right and this is anode and the ray comes out from perforated cathode it is cathode ray which we have discussed you know in the last experiment and what they observe the moment cathode ray comes out from this uh, you know cathode plate the same time only some positive ray also moves in the opposite direction of this cathode ray okay means cathode ray travels towards the positive charge electrode so this positive ray moves towards the opposite of the cathode ray because it is positively charged and it is negatively charged right so if this moves towards the positive plate this will go away from the positive plate okay so this ray since it is coming out since it is coming from this direction to this direction from anode to cathode so this positive ray we also call it as anode ray 
from this side to this side, anode to cathode, hence it is anode ray. Since it is moving away from the positive plate, hence it is, the anode ray is positively charged. Positively charged. Okay. So the property of this is what? You write down the properties. Anode ray Anode ray consists of Anode ray consists of a positive charged particle positive charged particles called protons. Okay, called protons. Next point. Proton is the smallest and lightest positive charged particles. Protons are the lightest and smallest positive charged particles and proton is nothing but H plus. Proton is H plus. Okay. Since it is lightest and lightest and the smallest positive charged ion H plus. Okay, next point. The behavior of anode ray, the behavior of anode ray the behavior of anode ray is different for, for different different gases. The behavior of anode ray is different for different, different gases. Okay. Next one, like cathode ray, next one, like cathode ray, it is also deflected by electric and magnetic field. Okay, like cathode ray, it is deflected by electric and magnetic field. Any charged, uh, you know, don't write this, any charged particle, if it is present in any wave or any ray, correct, it will always be deflected by electric and magnetic because electric magnetic field produce attraction or repulsive force on any charged particles, depending upon the charge present on them. Okay. So like this, we came to know about this fact that within an atom, like we have electrons and protons present. Okay. Now what happens after this, the third point is the discovery of neutron. Neutron. Okay. So neutron is what? It is a neutral particle. Neutral particle. It is neither positive charged nor negative charged. Okay. So what happens with this electron and proton? We already know this fact that neutron plays a role in defining the atomic mass of that particular atom, right? Because it is present in the nucleus. This fact we know already, right? So if you do not know about this neutron, obviously you cannot get the correct value of atomic mass of various atoms. 
so what happens there are various scientists they they came to this conclusion that with the help of only proton and electron the atomic mass of different atom could not be explained at that point of time okay so if there were any proton like only proton and electron present then atomic mass of different atoms could not explain properly okay there will be some you know error or difference okay then rutherford in 1920 suggested that in an atom there must be a third type of fundamental particles present which should be electrically neutral and possess mass equal to the mass of proton so rutherford suggested this that there must be some third type of neutral subatomic particles or fundamental particles present in the should present in the atom this proposal was given by rutherford in 1920 right later on james chadwick later on james chadwick in 1932 james chadwick in 1932 discovered electron sorry neutron so how do we discover this what he did actually he took he took beryllium atomic number mass number and this beryllium is attacked by alpha particle that is helium 4 and 2 so we say what beryllium is bombarded with alpha particle beryllium is bombarded with alpha particle and we get a nucleus of carbon and a fundamental particle also eliminates in this which is neutron which is neutron so this is the discovery of neutron we have this nucleus is this reaction is nuclear reaction okay nuclear reaction okay so this nuclear reaction the nucleus are involved in this that's why we are getting a different nucleus here yes alpha particle is he plus right alpha particle is he plus that generates from helium only that's why we have written helium over there to make you understand he2 plus in fact so actually what happens this helium you can write it down it converts into he2 plus plus 2 electron so this is actually alpha particle which comes out from this and to write down the reaction we use this one because it generates from this okay so this is how we came to this point that within an atom there are various fundamental particles or subatomic particles present and they are electron proton neutron mainly okay so like this we discovered electron proton and neutron copy this down all of you got it now you see till now what we know that so after this we have an atom right and within this atom there are various 
subatomic particles present. various subatomic particles present okay but how they are arranged means where are electrons present here where are protons where are neutrons so how this subatomic particles are arranged within an atom that we do not know okay so once they came to this point that where there are various subatomic particles present within an atom then how they are arranged within an atom that they started looking for okay and the arrangement of subatomic particles within an atom is given by different different scientists and all these attempt were made these attempts we call it as atomic models okay so what are the various atomic models we have atomic models i hope you understand that atomic models are what these are the various theory given by the different different scientists in order to explain the distribution of subatomic particles within an atom or arrangement of the subatomic particles within an atom this we call it as various atomic models okay so before going into that few points that we should know here that for electron electron proton and neutron the mass of electron you should know and that is 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg the charge on electron you know 1.6 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb coulomb stands c the mass of proton is 1.697 into 10 to the power minus 27 kg the charge on proton is equals to the charge on electron and that is 1.6 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb if you write down here the charge is negative here it is positive magnitude is same okay the mass of proton neutron is equals to 1.697 10 to the power minus 27 kg and the charge on electron neutron is zero because it is neutral that we already know okay these value you should know the other thing is what that electron is discovered by proton is discovered by goldstein and neutron is james chadwick this question actually they do not ask in the exam what they ask sometimes they ask the charge by mass ratio of this this and this means qe by me 
if you find out this the charge by mass ratio we also call it as a specific charge the charge by mass ratio is a specific charge sometimes they ask you this question what is the charge by mass ratio of electron proton neutron order okay so it is 1.76 into 10 to the power 10 to the power 8 coulomb per gram the charge by mass ratio of proton is 9.58 into 10 to the power 4 coulomb per gram so obviously the mass of proton is more charge is same so charge by mass ratio of proton is lesser than to that of electron okay and this charge by mass ratio is zero we do not find out okay so what we can write if you see this comparison QP by MP. The specific charge of proton is lesser than is lesser than to that of electron. This you must keep in mind. one more relation you see the mass of proton by mass of electron the ratio is 1837 approximately so this also you remember okay all these things they ask sometimes directly Done. Okay. Now, like I told you, once we know all these subatomic particles present within an atom, but the question is how they are arranged within an atom. So to answer this question, different different scientists they have given their own theory. in all these theory we call it as atomic models okay the so next heading you write down atomic model write down the atomic models explains the atomic model explains the arrangement of the arrangement of the various subatomic particles within an atom the various subatomic particles within an atom okay
Now, what are the different atomic models we have? Okay, the first model was given by J. J. Thomson, and we call it as Thomson model. What are the other name for this? Yes, what are the other name for this? We have watermelon model. watermelon model and we also call it as plum pudding right plum pie pudding or plum pudding model okay so all these are the same name we have according to this what thomson suggests it's he's given his own theory and what he suggests that atom is an atom is a an atom is a solid sphere positively charged solid sphere i guess you have done all these things in your 10th grade okay so again i won't take much time into this an atom is a positive charged solid sphere okay in ninth grade okay positive charged solid sphere in which the electrons are distributed in such a way in such a way that they experience minimum repulsion like this like this the distribution was there but this theory was not found to be was not found to be right this theory was not found to get fit into other various investigations like alpha particle scattering experiment and hence this theory was discarded right so write down quickly into this one according to this model according to this model an atom positively charged positive charge solid sphere in which in which the electrons are embedded in such a way in such a way so that they experience minimum minimum repulsion okay so later on what happened this model this model discarded later on because it does not fit for the other experiments or investigations correct okay. next one we have the second one that is that is Rutherford model. Rutherford model is given by obviously Rutherford. 
no he did not take he did not talk anything about the position of neutrons right actually the moment the when he gave his own uh, you know theory that time the neutron was not known okay that's why he did not talk about neutron but anyway that does not make any difference because the model was not correct so we have discarded it correct so rutherford model is given by the scientist called rutherford and this model is given by uh, you know by it, it is based on an experiment which we call it as the alpha particle scattering experiment so this model is based on write down it is based on alpha particle scattering experiment alpha particle scattering experiment which we also call it as gold foil experiment both are same thing gold foil experiment so what happens i'll show you the uh, you know the diagram the you know the experimental setup of it okay you have to draw this this one you see we have a lead block here a radioactive substance which is allowed to pass through a hole here lead plate and this is thin gold foil this is thin gold foil okay so you don't have to worry about it just you see the alpha particle passes through this and it strikes at the gold foil here so what is the observation we had here the observation is most of the alpha particles they passes through without any deviation they just passes through it without any deviation okay a few of them deviates by a very small angle you see this is the incident alpha particle this is the incident alpha particle okay so most of them passes through without any deflection they passes simply like this okay don't look at this now just you focus on here focus here some of them deviated by a very small angle and passes like this you see this is the figure we have right few of them deflects like this it comes back it reflects and comes back like this and there are very few which retraces their path means they goes like this it strikes and come back onto this path okay it comes back like this it goes strikes and comes back like this so this is what it happens you see here this atom because we have thin gold foil so we have thousands of gold atoms present into this foil so one of the atom is this we magnify one of the atom and this is this the atom of metal foil this one so what happens when alpha particles beams of alpha particles strikes very few of them deflects like this and most of them you see they passes through this atom without any deflection say it is like this without any deflection right so 
so there are so many alpha particles which passes without any deflection this was the first observation second observation was what a very few of them deflects by a very small angle i'll discuss the siddhant just a second just a second okay so first observation was what most of the alpha particle passes through the gold foil without any deflection okay a very few of them like few of them deviates by a very small angle and goes like this you can see this one and this one over here deviation right this one deviates like this by angle theta and this one deviates like this by angle theta okay a very few of them retrace their path you see it goes here it strikes at this point and comes back to the origin this three observation we made okay why do we use gold foil here the two things gold foils are first of all it's very thin we require a very thin foil over here the thickness if you see the thickness is around 0.0004 cm approximately so because of this thickness is very thin plus it is the gold foil is malleable also okay so because of these two properties we use gold foil for this particular thing okay so observation you write down here observation you write down first observation is the most of the alpha particle passed out without any deviation there's no deviation okay most of the alpha particle passed out without any deviation okay so what is the meaning of this when there is no deviation it means there is no collision here which further means that within an atom most of the space is vacant that is the first conclusion drawn from this observation so observation you have written most of the alpha particles passed out without any deviation next line which means which means which means most of the spaces within an atom most of the space within an atom is vacant okay most of the space within an atom is vacant the second observation is what write down the second observation the second observation some of the alpha particles some of the alpha particles deviates with a very small angle deviates with a very small angle deviates with a very small angle it means what this means that there are some positive charged particles also present within an atom there are some positive charged particles because alpha particle is positively charged he2 plus and when it get deviates it means there are some positive charged particles also present within an atom right now there are some positive charged particles present within an atom
ओके थर्ड पॉइंट थर्ड पॉइंट a very few of them retraced their path a very few of them retraced their path this means what why the this is the very important one okay this is the very important one why the particle retraced their path because the mass of the atom is concentrated in a very small region so mass is almost here present so when it collides with the very heavy mass here it cannot penetrate it and it comes back to its original uh, following the original path it comes back right so a very few of them retrace their path this means what this means the mass of an atom is concentrated within within a very small region called nucleus no this is not repulsion this is because of mass the particle retrace their path is because of mass if repulsion is the criteria then it could deviate in different angle it can go to the different angle charge can deviate it but since it retrace its path it is mainly because of the mass that is concentrated in the nucleus okay so this is the this is the very important you know observation and the result of rutherford uh, experiment that is gold foil experiment or alpha particle scattering experiment the discovery of nucleus takes place from this we got to know that there is a very small region within an atom it is present in which the mass of the atom is concentrated and this is small region later on is called as the nucleus of the atom okay now based on these observations and conclusion rutherford given its own model and that we call it as rutherford nuclear model so write down the heading next rutherford nuclear model rutherford nuclear model write down the main postulates of rutherford nuclear model the first point electron revolve around revolve around a nucleus around a nucleus like planets like planets revolve around around the sun second one electron revolves in a 
in a circular path called orbit. Electron revolve in a circular path called orbit. Next, the force of attraction force of attraction between electrons and nucleus nucleus balance the centrifugal force attacks on electron not attacks sorry acts on electron so this is the three postulates or three points given by rutherford for its atomic model okay right so these are the three points we have here now in this also we have a drawback right so what he said first of all you try to understand he said what that we have obviously we have a nucleus so we have an atom right and around an atom there are different orbits present like this there are different orbits present and electron revolves in this orbits no he did not talk about the number of electrons in this orbit okay we just have electrons and there is a reason very small reason which is the center of these circular path this reason is the nucleus this is nucleus and electron revolves around this nucleus in different different orbits like this this is what he said like planet revolves around the sun third point what he said because it is positively charged nucleus and this is electron so you must have some force of attraction you know what is centrifugal force could you tell me what is centrifugal force centrifugal force is a force acts on an object in outward direction this one this force is centrifugal force right so this takes place in outward direction the force that acts towards the center along the radius this force its centripetal force and this centripetal force keeps this object in this circular path yes so this force which acts in the outward direction that is the centrifugal force which takes place which act which acts on the object moving in a circular path now this is electron negatively charged and this is a nucleus positively charged so we must have some force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron electrostatic force of attraction so what he said this force of attraction balances the centrifugal force because the electron is revolving in a circular path like this so this force balances this centrifugal force of attraction that is what the third point we have for rutherford now 
we have a drawback in this point only what is that drawback i'll tell you okay now the point is according to according to the electromagnetic theory which is there in modern or this classical physics what electromagnetic theory says okay i'm just giving you this information electromagnetic theory says whenever a charged particle is moving under the influence of an attractive force right again i am repeating this or you write it down write down here drawback and then you write down this what is the drawback and how we discarded why we discarded this particular model also that you try to understand write down according to electromagnetic theory okay according to electromagnetic theory when a charged particle when a charged particle moves under the influence of whenever a charged particle moves under the influence of attractive force moves under the influence of attractive force it loses energy continuously it loses energy you write it down each of these points i'll just this point you write down i'll explain this what is happening okay whenever a charged particle moves under the influence of attractive force it loses energy continuously in the form of electromagnetic radiation it loses energy continuously in the form of electromagnetic radiation as the result as a result the electrons as the as a result the electrons loses energy as a result electrons loses energy continuously in every turn loses energy continuously in ev in every turn and comes closer and closer to the nucleus becomes closer and closer to the nucleus nucleus following a spiral path okay electrons should lose energy in every turn and moves closer and closer to the nucleus following a spiral path and finally it falls into the nucleus and finally it falls into the nucleus into the nucleus which makes the atom unstable okay following a spiral path and finally it falls into the nucleus and hence the atom becomes unstable next line since the atom is quite stable since the 
since the atom is quite stable hence the stability of atom hence the stability of atom is not explained by this model this is the drawback hence the stability of atom is not explained by right stability of atoms is not explained by this model okay so this is the drawback we have here the em laws are not applicable so no matter who told you this ken shuk from where did you get this tell me what is an electro ec this em laws or what electromagnetic laws what is electromagnetic laws that's what i said according to electromagnetic theory any charged particle it does not talk about that it is applicable for subatomic particles or not it is just it says any charged particle whenever in motion right whenever in motion under the influence of any attractive force it loses energy continuously since electron has charge over here and it is moving around the nucleus and there is attraction force also here hence it should lose energy continuously which is not happening here right according to electromagnetic theory if you go the electrons keeps on moving like this and since it is losing energy continuously so it won't be able to maintain the same path in every turn it loses energy hence it should follow the spiral path like this and keeps on going and going and going and finally it should fall into the nucleus according to the electromagnetic theory this is the theory that we have now when electron falls into the nucleus which makes the atom unstable because electrons does not fall into the nucleus an atom we know it is quite stable it is not like it is unstable substance atoms correct so hence this is the drawback of bohr's atomic sorry this one rutherford model and because of this drawback only we discarded this model discarded the model okay so what is the drawback the drawback is it could not explain why atoms are unstable according to this rutherford model the atom must be unstable but it is not the fact the fact is what the atom is quite stable right the second drawback is what this was the biggest blow for this particular theory the second drawback is what that it could not explain it could not explain the energy the energy velocity of electron in an atom okay 
these are the drawbacks hence hence the model was discarded later on okay like i said guys we'll take the reference of uh the classical physics to understand few things here in this chapter okay it's very theoretical initially later on we'll have numerical problems into this but to understand all these things you should we have to take the reference of physics the modern physics or classical physics that we have okay you will see in 12th standard in the last there is a chapter called modern physics there again you will study all these things atoms electrons other things right so we are taking the reference of those particular things that you should know like what reference i have taken here i have taken the reference of electromagnetic theory what is electromagnetic theory any charged particle in motion under the influence of an attractive force it should lose energy continuously this reference i have taken here to understand the the drawback of the rutherford model okay so these are the few models we have the most important and the next model we have here that is bohr's model okay but bohr's model like i said to understand this you should know various facts before this to understand the bohr's model right so first we'll discuss all those concepts and then we'll move into the bohr's atomic model okay so write down the discovery heading you write down this discovery leading to discovery leading to bohr's model we'll try to understand here what all facts what all you know important things we should know which is important for us to understand the bohr's model so first thing we need to understand here is the dual nature of electromagnetic radiation write down into this electromagnetic radiations electromagnetic radiation is nothing but electromagnetic radiations is nothing but electromagnetic waves it generates it generates whenever whenever a charged particles whenever a charged particles moves under any potential difference any any potential difference or in or in a magnetic or electric field electric field 
okay so electromagnetic radiations are this it's it consists of various waves when we have a wave so we have various wavelength and frequency like, like we have radio waves uv rays okay visible rays we have microwaves okay x rays we have so all these comes under electromagnetic radiations okay electromagnetic radiations unlike sound wave it does not require any medium to travel okay one more point to write down here unlike sound waves unlike sound wave it does not require any medium unlike sound wave it does not require any medium to travel okay these are the one property this is the one property of electromagnetic radiation which is very important and because of this property only it is used by the you know satellites and other things that they send pictures from the uh, you know from the universe when they you know go over there like we used to see the various pictures of mars okay so since in vacuum there is there's no medium over there then also we are able to receive those messages those pictures because we are using radiations electromagnetic radiations over there so it does not require any medium that's the one thing we are talking about the dual nature of electromagnetic radiations so electromagnetic radiations we are we all are very sure with it that it has wave properties these are waves example i have given you microwaves radio waves x rays and all right so these are waves right so dual nature means what it has wave characteristics as well as particles particle characteristics okay so wave characteristics we know they shows diffraction they shows interference there are many different things we have which confirms the wave characteristics of these radiations okay what is particle characteristics we'll discuss that right later but let us first understand since these are waves also so there are some terms associated with it right with the wave those terms we'll see first and then we'll move on to the next part next thing right so dual nature means dual nature means wave nature as well as particle nature wave nature and particle nature wave nature is defined by the various phenomenon like we have diffraction interference all these things you will dis you will study in physics okay diffraction interference diffraction is nothing but the bending of light right interference is the combination of two waves Okay, so I'm not going to detail of all these. You will study this in physics, right? Diffraction and interference. Yes, photoelectric effect. Actually, photoelectric effect confirms the particle nature, right? Not wave nature, but particle nature. We'll discuss that. Okay, photoelectric effect also we'll discuss. Okay, so the terms associated with a wave, write down.
the first term is wavelength wavelength is represented by lambda this is lambda okay wavelength what is the definition of it write down it is a minimum distance minimum distance over which a wave can be created okay look at this uh, okay this is the wave it travels like this now you see this it originates from this point right it originates from this point and here the velocity is in this direction so the other point where the velocity is again in the same direction parallel to this right this one from here to here it is one complete wave one wave is this from here to here this one is another wave second wave is this then we have third wave fourth wave fifth sixth seventh and all right so it is the minimum distance over which a wave can be created right so the distance or the minimum distance is this from this point to this point this is the minimum distance right so this distance is nothing but the wavelength of this wave that is represented by lambda right lambda minimum distance again from this point to this point you see it is another wavelength this distance is again lambda okay that is the wavelength of the wave okay this point this peak and this peak you see this distance is also is also one wavelength right this distance you see here from this point to this point just a second this distance is also wavelength that is one wavelength. okay this peak that we have here this we call it as the crest of the curve c r e s t so this is crest this is also crest this is also crest this one is trough trough this one is also trough right so we can define this wavelength as minimum distance over which a wave can be created this is one definition the other one is it is also the distance between two consecutive crest or two consecutive trough correct 
So the next point you write down, it is also defined as wavelength. It is also defined as as the distance between two consecutive crest or trough. This is the definition of wavelength. Correct? Wavelength, the unit is angstrom represented by this and one angstrom is equals to 10 to the power minus 10 meter one nanometer is equals to 10 to the power minus 9 meter one micrometer is 10 to the power minus 12 meter so all these conversion you should know Okay, so this is the unit we have. Mainly it is represent in angstrom. One angstrom 10 to the power minus 10 meter. Okay, so this is the term associated with any wave that is wavelength. Copy down this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, micrometer. Yeah, correct, correct. It is one picometer. Achha, one micro I have written. Correct. It is 10 to the power minus 6. One picometer is PM. Its picometer is 10 to the power minus 12. Meter. Okay. Mainly we will use angstrom, nanometer and meter. That is it. These three things we should now, the next term we have frequency. Frequency is represented by small f or nu this is not v this is nu okay small f or nu definition you write down it is defined by the number of wave produced per unit time number of wave produced per unit time okay so frequency nu is equals to 1 by t we can write where t is the time period right now the next term you see the third one it is time period represented by t time period it is the time required to complete one wave 
to complete one wave okay so in one wave the distance travel is the wavelength of that wave that is lambda right so we can write time period t is equals to the distance travel that is lambda divided by the velocity of the wave this is v so time is equals to distance by velocity okay this is what we have here so if we substitute this time over here this t over here so from this to new is equals to v by lambda this is velocity right so v is the velocity of wave right it is given by generally it is the speed of light that is what we use right so it is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second right so this is constant this is constant right so we can write the frequency into wavelength is constant here for this electromagnetic wave hence we can conclude this that frequency and wavelength for an electromagnetic wave is inversely proportional right so as as wavelength increases frequency decreases and when frequency increases wavelength decreases right this is the relation so all these formula you will get formula based question on this easy questions you will get one more term we have here this is wave number new bar this is wave number wave number is the number of wave produces per unit distance right so we know with the distance of lambda the number of wave produces is 1 that we know because we know in lambda distance one complete wave is there so this distance we have one wave so per unit distance we have right so for one the number of wave is what 1 by lambda correct hence the formula we have wave number nu bar is equals to 1 by lambda right and the unit of wavelength sorry this uh, wave number is we can write meter inverse the unit meter inverse okay unit i forgot to write in the terms that we have used previously time period you can use any unit of time
frequency unit is second inverse or it is also written as hertz Done. Okay. Now, one more thing here is electromagnetic spectrum. electromagnetic spectrum okay write down write down write down the different types of electromagnetic radiation the different types of electromagnetic radiation the different types of electromagnetic radiation which differs with each other which differs with each other in terms of their wavelength and frequency right again i am repeating this there are different types of electromagnetic radiation which which differs with each other in their in terms of their wavelength and frequency next write down when we arrange these radiations okay when we arrange these radiations in ascending or descending order in in ascending or descending order of their wavelength or frequency right in ascending or descending order of their wavelength or frequency then the spectrum forms is called electromagnetic spectrum then the spectrum forms are called electromagnetic spectrum electromagnetic spectrum now copy this down
this is cosmic rays UV rays, visible rays, visible wave we can also write, infrared, microwave, radio wave. Okay, now when you go left to right here, left to right if you go, wavelength increases, frequency decreases. Right to left if you go, frequency increases, wavelength decreases. Just a second, Shraddha, let me finish this. Okay, I'll repeat. Just a second, let me finish this, okay? Okay. yellow and then orange and then red okay so if you look at this this is v i b g y o r okay again you see red red color here you see it has maximum wavelength because again left to right wavelength increases and violet has maximum frequency right from this point to this point if you look at the wavelength this is 400 nanometer and this is 760 nanometer means this wave wavelength whatever wavelength falls in this range that we can see this is a visible range we have. Copy this down. Yeah, sure, that tell me. What did you write the last point? Did you write the electromagnetic spectrum, the theory of it? Electromagnetic spectrum, did you have written? Did you write? Did you write this, the definition of it? What is electromagnetic spectrum? So okay, I'll repeat. repeat yeah. so so yeah, I am no. like in the no, like. Can you just start from the beginning because I don't know. Uh, okay, right. I'm gonna start from the beginning of electromagnetic spectrum. Correct. The different types of electromagnetic radiations. There are different types of electromagnetic radiations, which differs with each other. 
which differs with each other in terms of their in terms of their frequency and wavelength in terms of their frequency and wavelength when we arrange these frequency or wavelength okay when we arrange this frequency or wavelength in either ascending or descending order in either ascending or descending order we get a spectrum which is known as electromagnetic spectrum which is known as electromagnetic spectrum okay after this shada i have drawn this uh, diagram that we have here thank you so much so sir yeah shada come again thank you so much sir oh, okay yeah so yeah yeah just a second guys just two minutes okay i know this is theory you know it's difficult to you know sit continuously like this because we are not doing any numericals numericals we can solve after some time okay few more things we have to discuss siddhant you don't have to all of you don't have to memorize the wavelength of all these but you should know at least this point that the visible reason the wavelength falls in this range 400 nanometer to 760 nanometer this value you should know 400 to 760 the second point you should know you all know this i guess web zero right so red has the maximum wavelength and that is the reason we use red light in for all this traffic signal now so that we can see this from a long distance okay so this is the electromagnetic red uh, spectrum and this is all for wave nature of any electromagnetic right we'll take a break now and after the break we'll start with the particle nature okay so we'll resume the session at 620 okay take a break okay guys 620 will resume okay is be on time okay thank you
Hello. Shall we start with that? Yeah. Okay. So we have this. We had discussed the wave theory of uh, light, wave nature. We have discussed. Now the next thing is. is the particle nature okay particle nature In this, we'll understand first what is Planck's quantum theory. Planck's quantum theory. Write down. You write down this. No, no, no. It's not. It's not double slit. It's different. Okay, write down the um, theory in this, and then we'll discuss. It's very important. Okay, it's very important to understand. If you don't get it, you will have difficulty in understanding photoelectric effect. Okay, so concentrate here. Write down. Write down the energy emitted or absorbed okay the energy emitted or absorbed the energy emitted or absorbed by a body by a body is always in discontinuous manner is always in discontinuous manner means the energy available means the energy available in the form of available in the form of small discrete packets in the form of small discrete packets and these packets are called quantum and these packets are called quantum i will explain this first you finish this theory called quantum next line in case of light in case of light the smallest packet of energy is called right the smallest packet of energy in case of light it's called photon but in general case but 
in general case these packets are called quantum is called quantum next line the energy of each quantum the energy of each quantum is directly proportional to the frequency of the radiation the energy of each quantum is directly proportional to the frequency of the radiation okay now we try to understand this suppose we have a radiation this is the radiation suppose we have okay any radiation correct any radiation we say this radiation is of frequency nu for example right and according to plan quantum theory the energy associated with this frequency or this radiation is e is directly proportional to nu this is what it is given in planck's quantum theory okay so if you remove this proportionality sign e is equals to we'll get a constant h times nu what is h h is the planck's constant h is the planck's constant this value you should memorize 6.626 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second okay so this is the energy associated with this frequency e is the energy we have here energy associated with associated with one quantum of frequency nu this is what we have. now you try to understand this if i write e is equals to h nu what it means okay we have a radiation of frequency nu i have already written here radiation of frequency nu but when we say e is equals to h nu means the energy of this radiation is h nu what do you mean by this suppose you have a light source right you can have a torch you can have a flash to your phone right the light emits from that light source correct so when i say this light is coming out of the light which is coming out of this particular source is of frequency nu and its energy is e is equals to h nu e is equals to h nu right so what do you mean by this we have a light coming out of a source and energy is h nu so how do we understand this particular how do we relate this energy with the light that is coming out of any source okay so here what happens e is equals to h nu what planck suggest that in any radiation the energy available in the form of packets so you can understand this that in this light of frequency nu there are there are a number of particles present in this light even if you have white light source also when you project light on any surface we say this is a light but in that light there are lakhs of particles present into those lights one after the other like you see this radiation consists of particles means we have particles present one after the other just a second you 
see this is the particles we have and it is discontinuous you see it is not continuous here it is discontinuous so any light source has this kind of particles present in it and when we strike lights we are striking these particles this particle is called quantum this is one quantum one particle is one quantum so we have so many quantums present in a light but if you have white light in presence in case of light the term we use we don't use quantum but we use photons so photons are the particles of light for any other radiation the particle is known as quantum right so quantum is the more generalized term we have photon is specifically we use for light okay this is for any other way this is one thing okay so first of all when i say e is equals to h nu it is the energy associated with one quantum mean suppose this light has frequency nu so the fr energy e is equals to h nu is the energy of this particle one quantum this particle also has h nu amount of energy this particle also has h nu amount of energy h nu amount of energy h nu amount of energy so energy is what energy is available in the form of packets okay it is in discrete manner it is not continuous it is in discrete manner it is not continuous right it is quantized we also say the energy is quantized so if i ask you what is the energy energy with n particles or n photons photons of radiation with frequency nu with frequency nu okay so energy of one photon e is equals to h nu we have so if you have n number of photon it is n times h nu okay so always keep this in mind when we write e is equals to h nu it is the energy of one particle present in that particular radiation okay you can understand this with a very simple example suppose you have a gun right when you strike you know when you hit on a target from that gun so what happens the bullet comes out from the gun one after the other it is not continuous no so if you replace the light source by gun right then the photon is replaced by the bullets so each photon you can understand here it is it represents the bullets from the gun so when you strike lights or light on any surface you are striking with the light particle actually so in case of light the particle is photon otherwise it is quantum so first of all one quantum or one photon goes and it strikes with the target then the second photon is strike third fourth fifth and so on it goes so basically the energy is available in packets and in discrete manner so we say that light particles or the waves the energy available in discrete manner in the form of packets this is the smallest packet of energy right one more thing here it is important that partial exchange of this energy is not possible either it gives the entire energy or it won't give anything did you understand the particle nature the quantum or the particles present in the light wave yes did you understand this clear please respond guys so always remember this so they may ask you in some questions they may ask you to find out the number of the number of photons required for this energy yeah the last portion i'll repeat that again this is the smallest particle right so when it gives energy when you strike light at any surface 
then the partial exchange is not possible you can compare this this packet with a packet of biscuits suppose you have 10 rupees no good day packet you have or parleji suppose you have right so when you go to the shop to buy that particular packet they cannot you know give you one or two biscuits from that packet you have to buy the entire packet one 10 rupees or 5 rupees packet or any stuff if it is packed you have to buy the entire packet you cannot you know tear it up and take one or two pieces from that particular packet right the same thing you can understand it over here this is very small packet if there is an exchange of energy then either the particle or the object or the target whatever we have on which the light is striking either it takes the entire energy associated with this packet which is h times nu or it won't take anything it reflects back all the energy so partial exchange is not possible in this did you get it clear okay so these two points you must remember the light consists of particles and the each of these particles in case of light we call it as photons okay so photons are the particles of light for other electromagnetic wave the term we use as quantum okay energy associated of the light energy available in the light wave in discrete manner it is not continuous means the energy associated with the particles present in the wave that can be either photon or quantum got it so exchange of energy takes place with this photon when photon strikes at any surface right and this photon is one after the other it is not like all photon strikes at the same time a very simple example you can always take the example of gun and bullet first of all the first bullet strikes at the target then the second bullet strikes from the same gun right then third fourth fifth sixth like that so one after the other the bullet strikes with the on the target correct same thing we have here also one after the other the photon or quantum strikes at the target clear so this is planck's quantum theory okay now we'll see some questions based on this like i said the session is mainly theory there are a lot of theory in this chapter we need to understand but from after this we can have numerical also we can do some numericals over here some very basic numericals okay question is i'll write down the question okay write down calculate the calculate the energy of a photon of light of wavelength of wavelength five point eight six two into ten to the power okay you need to find out the energy associated with it with one photon 
next one calculate if there is a lot of calculation you can use calculator to calculate okay calculate the calculate the frequency and energy of a photon a photon of wavelength 4000 angstrom okay so you always take care of unit in these kind of questions solve both questions Done. What is the answer? First one. Okay. So you see, you calculate the energy of a photon of light of wavelength. This we know the energy formula E is equals to h nu, and further we can write this as h. c by lambda okay wavelength is given you can substitute all the values here 6.626 10 to the power minus 34 joule second this is h c is 3 into 8 meter per second this divided by Five point eight six two ten to the power minus sixteen meter. So when you solve this, you see unit also you must take care of. Like I said, so all these second second meter meter gets cancelled, and when you solve this, you'll get the answer: the energy in joules. Okay, so this value, the energy here, when you solve this, you will get. Three point three eight into ten to the power minus ten. Is this the answer? The answer is three point three eight into to the power ten joules. Unit you also write down into this. Don't forget to write down the unit. Okay. Could you tell me the answer in this question? Calculate the frequency and energy of photon of wavelength. This okay. 
So fine, we know. E is equals to H nu at C by lambda for the 6.626 joule second Lambda is 4000 angstrom into 10 to the power minus 10 meter it is. So you have to solve this, you'll get the answer as E. Okay. Frequency is what? Nu is equals to C by lambda. So this ratio gives you frequency. Nu is equals to 3 into 10 to the power 8 divided by into 10 to the power minus 7. So it is 0 0.75 into 10 to the power 15. So which is 7.5 into 10 to the power 14. Sorry. 10 to the power 16. Fourteen and the unit of this is meter per second and this that is second inverse. What is the value of energy you are getting? Yes, it is 4.96 into 10 to the power minus 19 joule. Yes, so this is the answer for this question. You just need to know the basic you know, formula of all this, okay? You need to take care of units also here. Don't forget that. Okay, that's very important. Okay, one more question you see. How many photons of light of light having having a wavelength five thousand angstrom are are necessary to provide one joule of energy.
Done. Check your calculation, Akshat. Yes, that's right, Stuti. 2.5 into 10 to the power 18 photons, 1A. Okay, so suppose we have n number of photons here. So we can write E is equals to n times h nu. So n is equals to 1 joule of energy divided by 6.626 10 to the power minus 34 joule per second, sorry, joule second. And nu is C by lambda, so 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. And lambda is the wavelength that is 5000. 10 to the power minus 10 meter. When you solve this, you see all the units get cancelled. You'll get a number here. That will be 2.5 into 10 to the power 18. These many photons require to gain one joule of energy. Then understood. Okay. Now you see the another model that is Bohr's atomic model. First of all, this is the most important, most appreciated and accepted model we have till date. It's not like it is absolute. There are few constraints we have over here, right? Few conditions we have over here, right? So like I said, the Bohr's atomic model is the most appreciated, accepted and the important atomic model we have, the most important one is this. So first of all, you should know what is the constraint. Write down, it is applicable for applicable for only one only one electron system or hydrogen like species okay one electron system means hydrogen like species means which has only one electron right which has only one electron atom or iron has only one electron. For example, we can have hydrogen, we can have He plus, we can have Li2 plus, etc. Okay. So helium has two electron. So He plus has only one electron. Lithium atomic number is three, three electrons. So Li2 plus has only one electron. So this is the constraint here. Bohr's atomic model is applicable for only one electron system. What is the reason for this? That also we can discuss. We'll discuss that later in the last. Okay, once we finish it. 
Now, to understand this Bohr's atomic model, few things that you should know already. Okay, not things; it's formula basically that you should know. What are those formula? The formula is suppose we have two charge, Q1 and Q2, placed at a distance. Right. Suppose this is Q1. and this is q2 placed at a distance r from each other then two three points we can two three formulas we can define over here first of all this is electrostatic formula so the force between the two charges that would be equals to k times q1 q2 by r square this formula you should know where k is the k is the coulomb's constant coulomb's constant and this value is 9 into 10 to the power 9 newton meter square by coulomb square you don't have to memorize this value not required okay this is force of attraction if you talk about the potential energy here between the two charges it is minus k q1 q2 by r not r square it is r okay minus k q1 q2 by r okay these two formula you should know another one suppose if an electron is moving in a circular path any object if it is moving in a circular path then we can define angular momentum here right so suppose we have a circular path and in any object of mass m is moving in a circular path of radius r then its angular momentum is angular momentum is m v r mass into velocity into distance okay all these three things you will study in physics but here we are just using this formula to understand this bohr atomic model done copy so these three formula you know and now we are going to see m is the mass of this object whatever the mass we have here that mass we have here mass of an object m moving in a circular path of radius r with velocity v okay now so these three things you keep in mind now we use this particular three formulas to understand the bohr atomic model okay so first of all we'll see the postulates of bohr atomic model okay right on the first point here according to bohr 
he says that the negatively charged electron or simply write an electron revolves electron revolves in a circular path called orbit called orbit around the nucleus around the nucleus this is the first postulates of bohr's model which is similar to the rutherford atomic model so he took the reference of rutherford atomic model also that's why the rutherford atomic model was not completely wrong as uh, like if you see the concept of nucleus that we get from that model that was right okay it was not completely wrong okay next one write down write down there are there are energy level present within an atom within an atom and it is represented by and it is represented by 1 2 3 4 or k l m n and so on energy levels are represented by this okay these numbers or letters third one if electron stays in an orbit it neither emits or absorbs energy it just stays in the orbit nothing it uh, it does okay neither is emits nor absorbs energy the fourth one is if electron absorbs energy absorbs energy it jumps into into higher energy level higher energy level if electron comes down to the lower energy level it emits energy in the form of radiations emits energy in the form of radiation copy this down done okay okay done all of you
Okay. Now, the last two point is very important here. Sixth and the seventh one. Sixth point is the force of attraction the force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron between the nucleus and the electron balances the centrifugal force on electron okay seventh one out of out of infinite number of orbits around the nucleus around the nucleus electron revolves only in those orbits in which in which its angular momentum is integral multiple of h by 2 pi okay so these are the postulates of bohr's model the last two points are very important because to get the formula and other things we use these two postulates now Yes, H is the Planck constant. No, see, this one will discuss the one mathematical derivation of this later on, last point. But, but, but when Bohr was given this particular point, it is based on his research and study. There is no facts and proofs behind this. Okay. He has done his research and then he said that the angular momentum must be integral multiple of this. Right. That's what he did. But one mathematical derivation will have this. We'll discuss that later in Dree Broglie hypothesis later on. Okay. So now all these seven points are important for you to understand. The last two points are the most important one because we are going to use these two points only here to derive the formula. Now you see, suppose we have an nth orbit, like we have n number of orbits, you see, he said what?
see like this we have infinite number of orbits present okay and orbits has each of these orbits has different energies okay so here we have some amount of energy in this orbit in the second one first of all it is represented by 1 2 3 4 5 and so on or klm and we represent this okay all these first second third fourth orbits has a definite amount of energy if the electron present in this orbit this will have a definite amount of energy this electron has in this orbit it has a definite amount here a definite amount and a definite amount over here okay so when electron receives energy from any source like suppose if you try to you know provide energy to this electrons from an external source for example okay if you provide energy through radiation then electron receives this energy and jumps to the higher energy level further it receives energy if you provide another higher energy level then again jumps to the higher energy level so when it receives energy it may jump to the higher energy level similarly if it comes back if it comes down it has to release some amount of energy in the form of radiation further it comes down it has to release another radiation energy in the form of radiation again comes down release energy in the form of radiation right this is what bohr's suggest infinite number of orbit obviously you see with this particular wavelength the energy associated is what delta e is equals to hc by lambda hc by lambda so if it is lambda 1 this lambda 1 delta e is the energy difference between these two orbit these two orbit third and fourth one this is delta e this amount of energy comes out when the electrons comes down into the lower energy level this is what bohr's suggest first thing is that okay now like this the n number of orbits we have i am assuming nth orbit here this is the nth orbit i am assuming right and suppose the electron is present over here right and this is the velocity of this electron the electron here the mass of this electron i am assuming me the velocity i am assuming assuming vn because it is the nth orbit and rn is the radius of nth orbit this charge here we have electron e this charge here we have z times e z is the number of atomic number of the atom whatever atom we are taking and this atom must have one electron like we have hydrogen h e plus and li2 plus okay okay so this is the charge we have in the nucleus z e and e is the charge now if you compare this if i write down this line as here right this is the nucleus charge is z e this charge is e and this distance is r n can we write down the electrostatic force between these two charge which is here actually yes or no please respond guys quickly we can write down the electrostatic attraction yes the formula you know already i have given you the formula so i want you to focus on the formula we'll use that formula only over here so what is the electrostatic force here you see the electrostatic force f is equals to k times z e into e divided by r n square okay and this force actually this electrostatic attraction force here this balance the centrifugal force of attraction which is acting in the outward direction so this force equals to what we can write the centrifugal force centrifugal force i hope you all know mv square by r so vn square by rn is it clear did you understand this the first equation is this did you understand this centrifugal force is mv square by r you know this correct so this is the first equation we have 
correct further we can write this as z e square k times divided by r n is equals to m e v n square right i'll write down this as the first equation okay now the last yes the last point you see it says the electron revolves only in those orbit in which its angular momentum is integral multiple of h by 2 pi so what is angular momentum could you tell me mvr me vn rn integral multiple of h by 2 pi so n h by 2 pi this is equation 2 no doubt in this correct so now you see these two equation you see k is a constant we know the value of k we know the value of k k is 9 into 10 to the power 9 newton meter square coulomb square this is the value of k the mass of electron also we know that is 9.1 10 to the power minus 31 kg we know this value also we know the value of pi that is 3.14 right we know the value of electron the charge on the electron 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb we know the value of uh, uh, the other things right so we have all this this is that is atomic number so now these two equation if you see listen to me very carefully here these two equation you see you know all the values except vn and rn make sense agreed you know all the value except vn and rn yes or no correct so we have two variables and how many equation we have two so two variables two equation we can solve this for vn and rn okay so you don't have to solve this okay when you solve this you'll get the final expression as this the radius in nth orbit rn is equals to 0.529 n square by z angstrom okay this is the this is the radius we have now when formula is this very very important formula okay similarly when you find out for velocity in nth orbit that would be 2.18 into 10 to the power 6 times z by n this is meter per second okay this is the velocity we can find out the formula what is z here z is the atomic number z is the atomic number okay for hydrogen it is 1 but for, for lithium li2 plus it is 3 for he plus it is 2 n is the number of orbit 1 2 3 first second third fourth fifth orbit so i am assuming rn and vn is the radius of nth orbit and vn is the velocity of electron in nth orbit am i clear right no doubt this is very important that's why i'm asking you again and again and again okay so you need to first of all see this this formula obviously you have to memorize and you should also consider here because mostly they'll ask you to find out the radius ratio means they may they may ask you the radius in second orbit 
the radius ratio of second orbit and fifth orbit like that okay so radius ratio if they if they ask you to find out so we can see the radius in nth orbit or in any orbit it is directly proportional to n square by z because 0.529 is a constant only no? okay similarly we can see here the velocity vn is directly proportional to z by n so if you have to find out the radius ratio or the ratio of velocity in two different orbit just you need to know this relation because when you take ratio the constant term this term and this term will get cancel only okay now again you see this equation here if i find out the radius in first orbit r1 this will be 0.529 it's just a second wait we are trying to find out the radius of of first orbit radius of first orbit of hydrogen atom we also call it as first bohr orbit okay so for hydrogen atom i'll write down rh is equals to 0.529 one is square because first orbit so n value is 1 yes velocity of electron in nth orbit yeah so first orbit n value is 1 and z for hydrogen atom is 1 so we'll get here rh is equals to 0.529 angstrom okay this is first bohr orbit also we call it as okay and hence we can also write rn is equals to rh n square by z this is the formula we have okay now we are we're talking about an electron in nth orbit right so if you talk about the total energy of this electron present in nth orbit total energy e is equals to the kinetic energy of electron plus the potential energy of electron okay so total energy e is equals to the kinetic energy is half mevn squared because we know the velocity here is vn have already told you and mass is me and the potential energy you see between the two charge z e and e you see here z e and e the formula i have given you the potential energy is k times z e into e by r n is it clear did you understand this the first uh, in the beginning of bohr's model i have given you this formula the potential energy between the two charge placed at a distance correct now so this becomes what this becomes half mevn square minus k 
Z E square by R N. And we have already discussed that the fifth point, the fifth board atomic model, the fifth postulates we have, that is the electrostatic force of attraction. I am again writing it down here. K Z E into E by R N square. This equals to the balance the centrifugal force of attraction that is M E V N square by R N. So when you solve this, you will get M E V N square is equals to K Z E square by R N. So this is the equation one that I have written already. Now, if I multiply this half over here and half over here, this becomes what? This becomes the kinetic energy. Okay. And when you compare this term, the kinetic energy and the potential energy here, the kinetic energy is what is minus of half of potential energy. If you compare this one and this one, you see this term and this term, it's minus half of potential energy. Yes or no? Correct. So this, if you solve this one, the total energy that we get here, the total energy that we get here is if you substitute half of this is K Z E square by two times R N minus K Z E square by R N. So E value is negative K Z E square by two R N total energy is this. Now, when you substitute the value of R N, you will get the expression of E here, right? So total energy is this, which is negative. We are getting here, right? And when you compare this, this is also very important. If you compare total energy with kinetic energy, right? Total energy is what it is negative of kinetic energy and negative of kinetic energy is half of potential energy. So this is the relation of energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. Did you get it? Any doubt? Please respond quickly. We'll finish this. There's two more things left. Correct. Now you see this Rn you have already calculated. This Rn you have already calculated. You can substitute Rn here and you can find out the formula for energy. Okay. So this E formula, I'll write down here the total energy of an electron present in nth orbit is negative of 21.8 into 10 to the power minus 19. Z square by Z square by N square Joule per atom. This we can also write this as minus 13.6 Z square by N square. That is electron volt per atom. One, three, one, two, Z square by N square. It is kilojoule per mole. Okay. So these are the formula of energy in nth orbit. So if you look at all this formula, the energy in nth orbit is directly proportional to Z square by N square. This is the relation we have.
okay so again guys i am repeating here you don't have to memorize the uh you know the derivation of it derivation is not at all required what is required here i have explained this so that you can understand how do we get the formula right but to solve all the questions you should know the relation of this rn formula vn formula you should know the relation of kinetic energy potential energy total energy relation you required plus you also need this formula of energy that is it okay how it is coming what is the derivation that is not important okay but for understanding you should know what is the formula we have how do we get the formula so i hope you understand this okay the class was too hectic i can understand a lot of theory plus you know concept and you know derivation we have done we have done actually a lot today so okay i i'll, I'll request all of you right that you must revise each and everything before the next class okay we'll start from this only this formula we'll see some questions based on this how they frame the questions and few more concepts we'll discuss here okay so you must revise all this fine okay so thank you guys i hope you understand this a quick revision is required good night take care bye bye